Welcome back to the shop and to the channel. It's It's been a little while since I've done a little odds and ends video. I've got some new things that have come into the shop and I'd like to share them with you. I would ask that you at least give me a little bit of feedback on this video or these types of videos. If you like them, hit the like button. If you don't, hit the dislike button. That is one way as a YouTube creator, I judge what kind of videos I should bother making if if people like these kinds of videos uh, I'll, I'll make them every now and again nothing on a regular cadence or basis but at least I know that if you like to watch them I will continue to make them your comments are also always welcome um, even the negative ones I really don't mind reading them so if you've got something to say or something to share don't be shy. Go ahead and leave a comment. Let me know what you think. The other day, I got a package from Amazon, and I didn't remember ordering anything. And it turned out that I received a gift from Mike. I'm not sharing Mike's last name because I didn't tell him I was doing this. But what these are are a set of angle setup blocks. Uh, they got a number of different angles on each one of these to where you can set something up at a specific angle uh, and you can stack them to to get uh, something that's not represented in a single block and these goes down to the quarter of a degree so pretty much everything from a quarter of a degree up to 90 degrees I can build by using a combination of these blocks this is a pretty cool thing and it's something I've been wanting to add to the shop for a while. Now these might be a little worse for wear. They're not in perfect shape, but it is a near complete set of CE Johansson gauge blocks. Now these also have the Ford logo stamped on them. A couple of them have been replaced. They're not all uh, Ford, but the majority of them are, I think, there might be two or three of them like this one that's not original to the set. Now the, the concept of the gauge blocks was invented by a Swedish man named um, C.E. Johansson and he ended up working with Henry Ford um, supplying gauge blocks for the manufacture of the Model T and Ford ended up buying the company Lock, Stock and Barrel and Johansson ended up moving to Deerfield uh, eventually um, Ford sold off the gauge blocks to Brown and Sharp but because these have the Ford logo on them I suspect that these were made prior to that which was in 1948 so these are pretty old they'll still work for what I need to use them for in my shop Well, I came across this set of adjustable parallels. They were really cheap, but there's a reason for it. They're kind of rusty. And I'll try to clean these up with some Evapo rust and wire wheel. I've got a smaller set, but having these bigger parallels will be kind of nice to have. We'll see if I can get them cleaned up enough to be usable. Well, along with those adjustable parallels, I got this set of Mitutoyo uh, radius gauges. Now, this is the larger set, or a larger set. These go from 500 thousandths to one inch. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am missing the 650 thousandths radius gauge. So, if you happen to know where I might be able to find one of those, let me know in the comments. I've been keeping my eye out on eBay, but I haven't found anything as of the recording of this video. Well, I found this uh, collection of stair micrometers at a little auction. Um, all of them are in at least half of a wooden case. It looks like they might have been part of a larger set. I'm not sure. I have to look up some of these numbers uh, a number of these I'm not going to keep because I already have a set of or these are some of them in these sizes but the larger sizes I don't have 
These bottom two sets look like they are complete, I guess. Um, this one here is a, a six to nine inch micrometer. It uses the interchangeable anvils to give you those three different ranges. And it even came with standard, so calibrating it should be relatively easy. And then this set here on the bottom is a 9 to 12. Again, I have all the standards. Now these aren't vernier micrometers, so they read to the thousands of an inch. It would have been nice to have something that read to the tenths, but I don't see myself needing to use these very often. But the uh, other one came in handy because I needed something that would read from six to seven inches and I was able to use that when machining the back plate for the South Bend lathe. Back in uh, early January I took a trip over to Pennsylvania uh, about a couple hours outside of Philadelphia. I met up with Mick from Mick's Workshop to visit the Cabin Fever Expo event. Um, for 2024 it's my first time coming here and boy was it a lot of fun a lot of stuff to see they had a big consignment area um, a lot of things up for auction and just hundreds if not thousands of model engines of all sizes um, and types a lot of steam engines being powered by compressed air of course and a lot of little machine tools being driven by them. Uh, they even had a good collection of hit and miss motors and even quite a few internal combustion engines. And people also brought along their model boats and there were some uh, model excavators and bulldozers. They had these big piles of dirt out in one of the exposition halls. And it was quite remarkable. Honestly, I didn't know these things existed and I might end up having to find room for another hobby because these were a lot of fun to watch. So I would imagine they were a lot of fun to play with. There were also various examples of live steam locomotives like this Shea locomotive that's uh, still under construction, but uh, it's just magnificent when you look at it. You can tell some of this has been CNC machined and other parts of it uh, manual machined, but it, it was quite remarkable to see. And there were some electric trains too. I mean, if you're going to go to a model uh, engineering expo, you got to have some electric trains. There were some other uh, live steam locomotives uh, there as well under various states of construction, but quite, uh, quite an accomplished group of craftsmen for sure. Cabin Fever is held not too far from where Shane Winters from Winters Machine Shop lives, and so we were lucky enough to stop by his shop and get a look around. Unfortunately, I forgot to take the obligatory selfie of the three of us, so I asked AI to do it for me, and this is what it came up with. And while I was there, I ran into Gary Martin from Martin Models and Patterns, and I made a deal with him on this 12-inch uh, straight edge. Uh, I've been wanting one of his castings for a while, and it was a good way to save on the shipping because uh, he had them there at the show and I'm looking forward to machining and scraping this. Not related to cabin fever but the makers of Canode uh, spotting dies are now making this stuff again. Um, I understand that it was out of production for quite some time 
but they started making it. So I went ahead and ordered some blue and yellow, which are the traditional colors, but I add a little bit of orange and red to the order. I want to see, maybe I like those colors better as contrast. Who knows? Well, I got an interesting little tool here that came into the shop. Let's say you've got some holes like this that are maybe even deeper that have some burrs on them and you need to deburr them. And there's a few ways to do it. And one of those is with this tool called an Orbitool. And I don't remember specifically which episode it was, but I saw this being talked about on the Practical Machinist YouTube channel. And I thought it was pretty interesting. And I wanted to see you know, where I could get one from. So I went to their website and I filled out the little contact us form saying, hey, you know, I'm a hobbyist. And I thought this was kind of a cool, interesting tool. Um, you know, where can you get these things at and how much are they? I got a response from Stan Kroll, who I'm not exactly sure what his title is there, but he attached a price list and said, you know, I could pick these up at, you know, my local tool supply or you can even get them direct. Well, it turns out these things are they're intended for CNC production shops, but, you know, you can use them manually, um, but each one of these tools is over a hundred dollars a piece and that is way out of my price range as a hobbyist like I can't afford to do that so I thanked Stan for his replies to me and you know kind of giving me the lowdown and you know let him know that it was just out of my budget and he said hey we've got some demo units that we've used for demonstration I'll just send one to you and you can have it you can give it a try and incidentally he had no idea who I was or that I had a YouTube channel or anything so this wasn't any kind of a quid pro quo he just offered to send it to me along with the adapter that I can use it on uh, you know a standard Dremel rotary tool so I thought that was really cool that he was offering to send this thing to me, you know, free of any charge with no obligation of, you know, just some, some guy who sent him an email saying, Hey, I thought you have a cool product. So this thing works really well. Um, I was uh, impressed with how well it removes those internal burrs. Well, it's been a long time coming, but I finally have some climate control in the workshop. I broke down and spent full retail on a Mr. Cole 18,000 BTU um, air conditioner slash heat pump. I got this installed between Christmas and New Year's with the help of my son who was working as an electrician at the time. And, you know, watched a bunch of YouTube videos and everybody made it look so easy. I was doubtful. I was skeptical, but I'm no longer a skeptic. This thing actually installed pretty simply. We took our time, you know, taking care of little bits here and there. I didn't do it all in one shot, but quite frankly, I could have. It could have been, you know, less than a day to install this thing. I, you know, intended to get one of these for a while so I could have some air conditioning in the shop. But since this is a heat pump, it will provide some heat. It will heat down to, I think, minus 13 Fahrenheit. So I think that's in metric. I think that's what, six kilograms? I forget. Anyway, it is 20 degrees outside and it's a nice 62 in the shop and that's where I'm going to keep it most of the time is at 62 that happens to be the lowest temperature you can set the heat on so it'll be interesting to see what my electricity consumption is for the first month
I will say here in Northeast Ohio, uh, it has been a very mild winter so far. The snow that you see in this video is the first real snowfall that we've had. I don't know if it's climate change or if it just happens to be any particular cycle of why we have good or bad winters, but I'm definitely looking forward to having a warm shop this winter. Now these piles of bits um, look pretty bad. They look pretty rusty, but this was part of the same auction that those micrometers came out of. And somebody might look at these and consider them junk and probably throw them away. And maybe they are junk, but I spent a little bit of time with these in the Evaporust and the wire wheel, and I think they came out reasonable. Well, the first thing here that I cleaned up that we'll take a look at is this arbor. Now, I didn't know what it was at first. Um, this box was part of what was in the auction, but it wasn't until I started digging through it and taking a look at some of the paper that was in there that I realized what this was and looked it up. This is called a Peterson Flush Arbor. Now, I can't really tell because some of these um, pages are stuck together, but it looks to be a rather complete kit. Did a little research on this, and they still make this thing, and it's a patented design for simultaneous uh, side and face milling. So the way you mount the cutter on the arbor uh, mounts it completely flush. There's no fastener sticking out from the bottom that would normally be holding on a slitting saw or something of that nature. So after you get this thing all together with the cutter, there's this expandable sleeve, which is, I guess you might say, is the secret sauce. Um, it slides down over or, or inside the bore of the cutter and at the top of it there's a little bit of a shoulder. So then you put on one of these special washers that's got a countersink in it and attach it with a countersink cap screw. Now, as you tighten down that cap screw, that sleeve expands and it captures the milling cutter. Now, this is a broken cutter, so I don't mind beating on it, but it's not, it's not going anywhere. It's not coming off of the arbor. And now I can use this to not only face mill with it, but also side mill with it at the same time. Also in that rusty pile were these three shell mill holders. They looked pretty bad, but again, a little bit of soaking in the evaporust along with some work on the wire wheel, and they cleaned up just perfectly. Well, these R8 end mill holders were also in that pile, and they cleaned up pretty good. I don't know if there's any run out on them or not. I'll still have to put them in the mill and maybe use a gauge pin in there to check for run out, and quite frankly, for what I paid for the stuff, if they're junk, I'll just throw them in the scrap pile and take them to scrap. One of the bonuses in that rusty pile were these drill chucks. These are two um, Jacobs ball bearing super chucks uh, that this one in here is a little bit pitted from some surface rust, but operates just smooth as silk. I might still take these things apart and give them a good clean and maybe a little fresh grease. And then this here is a genuine Albrecht keyless chuck. Again, it operates smooth. You wouldn't know that this thing had a little bit of surface rust on it. It cleaned up just absolutely beautifully. Well, and the last bits that were in that pile of junk were all of these milling cutters. A couple of these are broken and will end up in the scrap bin but most of them are in fine shape and they're sharp. Um, there might be some that could use a little bit of resharpening, but all in all, these turned out to be in really good shape. And these were just cleaned up with some evaporust 
I did end up with something I needed, which is a slitting saw, and I have a whole bunch of blades. So if any of them are junk, uh, again, I'll just toss them, throw them away. Uh, but the other ones that uh, do still have some teeth left in them, I'll be able to put to use. The next uh, bunch of items came out of a machine shop that went out of business that was about two miles from my house. And first up is this collection of pin gauges. Um, most of these I have no use for. They are very specific, special sizes, likely for special jobs that that shop was doing. So I don't honestly know what I'm going to do with them. They're not worth, you know, putting up for sale anywhere. So they'll probably just end up in a toolbox drawer somewhere. The only thing I really wanted out of this lot was this set of pin gauges. This is the small set, which I think is M0. Uh, goes from 11 thousandths up to 60 thousandths. Um, and the only reason why I wanted it is I didn't have it. And this kind of stuff comes in, in handy. And the lot sold for a fairly good price. There was a couple of missing, but I was able to go up to my local tool supply and buy replacements fairly cheap. Next item here is a demagnetizer. Um, I was told by a friend that uh, I should have one. I didn't have one. Um, it's not a magnetizer, it's just a demagnetizer. The lamp is broken on it, but it does light up and it's small enough that it'll fit on a shelf. But in order to get that small demagnetizer, I also had to take this big one. Um, I really don't need this one, but you know, what the heck, I'll put it up for sale. And see if someone's interested in it. It's actually in two sections, so it has two power cords, two power switches. Um, I think that's because of uh, the load on the circuit. These should be plugged into two different circuits according to the directions. But again, both of them, both sides work. Um, they do what they are promising to do, um, but I just don't have any use for this big one. Um, these little drawers hold the power cords and like I said both sides work one side the the lamp cover was broken but other than that it's in in decent shape so but it's heavy it's really heavy so it's either going to be a doorstop or it's going to end up going to the scrapyard well I have a thing for angle plates and these were in that auction and they were in really good shape um, they are drilled on one face, um, and it's not symmetrical. They're not both drilled the same, but they do have at least one face that is unadulterated, and I kind of like that. So what I might end up doing with these is um, uh, mill these on the horizontal mill and then maybe turn it into another scraping project. I don't know. But um, these kinds of things are nice to have when you need them. And if you don't have the angle plate for some strange setup, you got to go find one. So these are small enough to fit on a shelf, and they were cheap enough, so why not take a chance? Well, I've shown this Arbor Press in other videos, but this is how it came to me. This is a Famco 13R Arbor Press. Um, it's not your typical arbor press as it doesn't have a daisy wheel. It's just got this very large throat on it. Um, but it did come with this stand. Um, it was in a bit of some rough shape. The top of the stand actually has a crack in it. Um, I did try to braze weld it uh, back together, but that was mildly successful. Um, but I ended up uh, cleaning it up and giving it a good paint job. And now it sits uh, in the spot that it's in here. And I've been able to successfully use it on several projects. So uh, I, I like having it. I would like to make some sort of a shelf for it where I could mount a daisy wheel. Uh, because I would find a daisy wheel to be a lot more useful than, at least in my shop, than this large open throat. Well, this is one of those items that you see at an auction 
and when no one's bidding on it and it's almost over and the opening bid is ten dollars you go ahead and virtually at least raise your paddle and put in a ten dollar bid and what you come home with is a troik 12 inch rotary table with this large shaft extension on it and attached to that shaft extension is a servo power feed I've never seen anything like this before now the thing is covered in all sorts of rust but the power feed works but it only works in one direction which is interesting to say the least now that might be that there's intentional only to turn in one direction or it might just mean that there's something wrong with the power feed one of these days this will be a project I don't know if I'm going to video it or not but I will take this thing apart I am going to clean it up I'll probably fly cut the uh, table to get it nice and flat and maybe see if I can't fix that power feed it's too big for my table I was kind of hoping it might have been a 10 inch but it's a 12 inch so this is likely going to end up going up on fake book marketplace for some local lucky person well in another one of those no one's bidding on it moments um, I paid ten dollars for this Delta Rockwell benchtop uh, drill press and as far as I can tell it's complete I don't know that there's anything on here that shouldn't be on here and I don't believe there's anything missing um, that's not on here this might end up as a restoration project for the channel drop me a comment let me know would you like to see this turn into a restoration project I would like to clean it up maybe paint it we'll see what the paint looks like and I plan on keeping this I do have that other craftsman that's on the other end of the workbench but it would be kind of nice to have two different drill presses for uh, projects in which I need to do a lot of drilling and chamfering and I won't have to change bits now my friend Jeff who lives out in California also known as another home shop guy came across a whole collection of different kinds of lathe parts and accessories and in that group was this follow rest which fits my 13 inch South Bend lathe I believe it is a South Bend I believe it's intended for the lathe I cleaned it up and painted it but other than that I mean there's not a whole lot to these things so I do have a project in which I might need to use this uh, might need a little bit extra modification but I'm glad to have it in my arsenal so thanks Jeff for shipping this out to me a new friend that I met through the old woodworker machinist forum um, pointed this out to me he was over at my shop I was doing some machining work for him and he, and he showed me this that was on Facebook locally in, in my city and it's a, a union uh, tool chest machinist tool chest it's missing the front cover um, but I think I can probably get something like that made um, the lock for it might be an interesting thing to make but we'll see how that goes I did do a bunch of research on this to sort of date it and I am extremely confident that this thing was made somewhere between 1916 and 1918 which makes it at least 105 years old and I think that's pretty remarkable my plan is to clean this up I haven't decided if I'm going to refinish it like restain it um, and get that front cover made but other than that this might end up just on my bookshelf in my office I don't know that I'll put any tools in it because quite frankly I don't have any room in my shop for something like this and it might just be too nice well on a whim I did another ten dollar bid on something that just said grinder on the auction and I could see it was a tool post grinder hoping that it was going to be the right size for my lathe turns out it's too big for my lathe I ended up putting this thing up on marketplace just before this video was done and was able to sell it but sitting on the pallet with that tool post grinder was this thing this is a st. Mary's spin roll grinding fixture it's motorized and it's got these rollers on it that allow you to place a pin or some other object and do a precision circular grind on it I had no idea what this thing was I posted it up on one of the Facebook forums and 
somebody responded with what he thought it was doing a little bit more research and he was absolutely right these things do sell for a pretty penny um, and it's not something that i have a use for so i'm not going to be keeping it and it is still currently available looking for a new home to the right buyer well that's going to be it for this video i think that's enough um <laughs> auction season's coming up so who knows there might be more things to add to the shop and quite frankly it's how i am able to tool up my shop without going broke if i were to buy these things new or if anybody was to buy these things new um, it the budget would exceed what i paid for the machines which again that wasn't uh even, even top dollar there because i don't mind buying a machine that might need a little tlc and a little cleanup i i'll put in the sweat equity in order to get a more budget friendly deal well if you've made it this far i appreciate you watching and i hope you enjoyed it and if you did again hit that like button hit the dislike button if you don't like these i'm not going to be offended well i appreciate you watching thanks again and we'll see you on the next one